chapter 17, and I'll preach from there tonight. Chapter 17. I want to talk about preaching to someone with a different worldview. Like, uh, you know, when I mean by preaching is not necessarily like this applies to me because I'm the preacher, but I mean like preaching, like giving the gospel to somebody, sharing Christ with somebody. I mean, it could be you sit down at a Mexican restaurant or a Chinese restaurant or whatever, and you tried to reach that person that came and you give them a tract or whatever uh, your habit might be. And or you begin to talk to somebody, and you might find out real quickly that there are some barriers there beyond just the language barrier, but maybe some just ideas and the way they think about things. Sometimes it makes it hard for people to uh, even talk and communicate with somebody from a different culture, and oftentimes we just kind of, you know, segregate and just, you know, decide not to do that. Speaking of segregation, that same is true. You know, I would say not so much with a black versus white thing, but a culture, you know, like the hip hop culture versus like the uh, country western type culture and, and uh, all this, like there are, there, are jo- there are types of people have a hard time connecting with it. We learned that in high school probably, like this guy, this group of people had a different worldview, a different way of looking at life than, uh, than we did. So there's lots of different things where you, you might be sharing Christ with somebody who doesn't think things through exactly uh, the same way you do. Primarily when I'm talking about preaching and dealing with somebody with a different worldview, uh, you know, I'm thinking of their philosophies on just the way things work. A lot of that's going to be based on their culture and their religious views that have been passed down from their parents or whatever. And I'll talk more about that here in a minute. But, uh, you know, when we, on Thursday nights in Kansas City, I'm doing a series on the philosophy of ministry. So looking at like why we do some of the things in church and in the minute, the different ministries of our church, why we do it the way that we do it. A lot of it's not something you could pinpoint from the Bible like this. We do it this way because it's in the Bible. But there's just like different philosophy uh, that we might have. But a worldview is a little bit bigger than that. A worldview, I would say, uh, well, I mean, I guess, I guess that, would, that would be included as well. You know, sometimes the worldview is kind of a bigger, bigger thing than that. Thing that we can, you know, maybe a Christian worldview, we could go to another country and sit down at the table and still share a lot of worldviews because we believe, agree on the Bible and stuff like that. But anyway, with this idea of missions, this idea of world missions, I want to think about how there are different worldviews out there that we might have to uh, come across and deal with when we're presenting the gospel. Now think about this, I'm sure that people see us as independent fundamental Baptists that uh, particularly those when we go out and knock on doors or we carry ourselves a certain way, you know, there are those that will look at us and see us as being very strange. And I don't mean just the obvious like, hey, that, that guy's a little strange, but I'm talking about the things that we do are foreign concepts to them. You know, they just weren't raised uh, with some of the... Uh, the views that we have, the practices that we have. Now, some of you in here might think, you know, hey, I, I remember. I remember when I thought Christians were weird. I thought, you know, independent Baptists were weird. I went into church and I thought the, the hymn singing was weird. I think the way that people talk is weird. Reading the King James Bible, I used to think that was weird and now I don't. Some people might, might, might say that, you know. And so you have to remember that when we go knock on someone's door, they might see us with that same lens of saying, these guys are a little, a little different, a little weird, you know. And it might not be this just common like, oh, I've been waiting for this independent Baptist to knock on my door. Please share the gospel with me. It might be like, what are these guys doing? And, uh, you know, I've noticed that in some cultures, uh, particularly the Latin American culture and the uh, African culture, you know, if we go to a town that, that is represented by one of those uh, groups of people, I think that it's also a worldview that they sit there and they're polite and they listen to us when we preach the gospel. Even if they're not believing what we're saying, a lot of times that's part of their culture, part of their custom and the way that they look at things like I need to invite this person in or, or whatever and, and talk with them. These kinds of things we need to think about. Okay, uh, Some will look at us just the fact that we're going door to door and knocking on doors as very strange. I've 
I've had people just stare at us like, why are you doing this? You know, what, what is the deal? I mean, uh, I, if I wanted to go to church, I would go find, I would look in the, wait, we don't look in phone books anymore. I would go online and find a, uh, I would find your church. You know, why are you knocking on my door? Why are you bothering me? I mean, there are some people that have that kind of mindset. Or they just look, you know, like at our children. Maybe our children are with us. And like, why are you making them do that? Like, I, there are people that think it's strange. Maybe uh, the way we dress and the way we behave. Uh, you know, why are your ladies wearing skirts and dresses and, and looking very feminine and your men looking very masculine? Like, that's weird. There's cultural views about that in our, even in our country where we look kind of strange at the door. Again, this speaking in the King James Shakespearean English, well, not that we speak that way all the time, but when we read the Bible, they're like, what are you talking about? Like, why are you, why are you talking uh, a different language, you know? Or we use this Baptist lingo, you know, that we're, we grew up using these. They were like, I got to think about that with, with a potluck. We were like, potluck? What is a potluck? Well, if you're Baptist, you, you're, if you grew up Baptist, you know what a potluck is. <laughs> it's not the 100-mile run, but, but the, uh, uh, the actual, you know, everybody brings food and we share it and we eat it. Where did the word come from? I don't know, but that's just what we, uh, that's what we call it, potluck. And uh, anyway, there's all these things to think about. The fact that we're trying to get them to come to our church, some people think that's weird. Like I go to the church that my family goes to, and we just, we just go, and you know, you're not supposed to invite people to other churches. I mean, who knows? Who knows? There are weird thoughts that people might have at, when you come to the door. And I don't want to say that to make you think like, oh, man, that's even more intimidating. Like I'm going to be scared because if I go to the door, they're going to see me as some weirdo or something. No, we should be who we are. We should be representing Christ and, and, and f just perfectly fine and comfortable with our worldview. But we do need to understand, we do need to recognize that there are different uh, worldviews out there. Now, there are a lot of different worldviews out there that are based on their religion or their culture or their traditions. Uh, there are some who put a huge emphasis on family, you know, and I've I've noticed this a lot with a lot of Asian cultures, like, uh, you know, these people are, are not just taking care of their family and then, I mean, their, you know, their household, and then whenever the kids grow up and they leave the house and they're on their own, a lot of times, like, they're all, like, helping each other out, and, and uh, you know, that's why some of the businesses, they'll never go under because they're always helping each other keep that business going, and, and uh, there's just a philosophy, it's just a way of life that, that might be a little different than some. Uh, the way that, you know, some can live off of a really low income and they don't, they're just fine with that. You know, it's more important to them to just be able to have the leisure or the, uh, you know, family time. Uh, sometimes people have no, you know, in the, in the United States, for the most part, now obviously there's exceptions, uh, but for the most part, people are all about got to be on time. Got to be there when you say you're going to be there. Got to be there 15. If you're, if you're in there, if you're, if you're there later than 15 minutes early, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah less than 15 minutes early, then you're late. You know, some people have that idea. You gotta be on time. Well, if you go to some cultures, they have no concept of that, no concern about that. It's like, well, church starts at seven, but my friend just came over, so we're gonna sit down and talk, we're gonna make some coffee, we're gonna do all this, and then, you know, and I've heard missionaries on other fields say, you know, sometimes if church starts at seven, they might be eight, eight nine o'clock before people start piling in <laughs> because you just don't know. Like, you just gotta do something and wait for everybody to come. These are different cultural things and different uh, ways of looking, you know, at, 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 you know, customs and stuff like that. But an overall worldview that's based on like religion and tradition has been passed down, whatever, uh, can be divided up into some of these categories. I want to just share these real quick. So here's one that we see creeping up in a lot of places, especially in, uh, like European countries and stuff like that is atheism. Atheism agnosticism, we've seen a growing amount of that in the United States, of course. People who want to view the world without religion, and they want to think through things from a scientific and, and, and logic or, or whatever they, uh, they will claim without looking at the Bible and those or any, any other religion. That's not important to them. I talked about a lot this morning on humanism, secular humanism, and uh, today, schools and educators seem to be promoting this. Uh, this, I think it's a religion, you know. Uh, but this humanism, 
fits really well with atheism because it's like, you know, if you don't have any religion, then great, you fit right in to just try to do what's good uh, for your fellow man or whatever, and we'll just all get along without religion. Uh, interestingly, you know, I say that this, the public schools and the educators and all uh, are really promoting this. There's a guy, uh, we were out door knocking here in Iola, and there's a guy who, uh, when I began to talk to him, he said that he was an atheist. And I said, oh, how'd you come about being an atheist? I mean, what, what's your background? He said, well, I, I, I guess school. And I was like, what, what do you mean? I thought he was kind of being a little bit of a smart aleck and saying like, well, I became an atheist because I got an education and I know better than to be, <laughs> to be religious. But I began to talk to him. It was like, well, they, you know, I went to school and the professors taught us about, you know, uh, evolution, and they, they taught us this and that, and, and he says, I, I guess after going to school for a while and, and uh, thinking through all those things, I just said, well, I guess there's no God. And so I talked with him a little bit about that, and so, so look, there are, there's a worldview that's being taught in the public schools to people today, and maybe it's strange to some, maybe if we went into the public, so I grew up, uh, you know, I've told my testimony before, my, my parents weren't saved whenever I was really little. But by the time I was about seven years old, eight years old, they're saved and we're going to church and growing rapidly uh, in, in, uh, in knowledge of God's word. But probably around the time I'm nine, ten maybe even, I went to school and they started teaching us about evolution. First time I'd ever actually, I mean, they maybe had taught some concepts and I just didn't catch it or something. But this concept about us coming from, from monkeys or, or chimpanzees, whatever, and uh, primates. And I, and I came home to my parents. I'm a, I was a Christian. I didn't even really think about the fact that that's not compatible to God's word. I just came back and said, nobody's ever told me that we came from monkeys. And my parents' eyes got big, and they're like, uh-oh. <laughs> right? To me, this is a weird worldview. Like, what are we talking about? And to some people in the world, they've just always grown up hearing that. So whenever we say, well, the Bible teaches, and there are some Christians I know that would disagree with this, but... Say, well, the Bible teaches that the world's roughly around 6,000 years old. And, uh, and God created all these animals and everything. They lived together, even dinosaurs. Dinosaurs and man walked together, and they're like, what are you talking about? My professor told, told me that, you know, dinosaurs went extinct 64 million years ago, and man didn't come around until, uh, you know, well after that. And, and so to, uh, to them, our worldview is strange. It's bizarre. To us, their worldview might be strange, but the point is, if we're trying to preach Christ, we have to understand that they're going to look at the Bible through a different worldview and a different uh, understanding. So agnostic, uh, agnosticism, atheism, humanism, all these are a, a, a type of worldview, I guess. Maybe I'm not using the right word, but a worldview that people have based off of that, relig that religion. I would call it a religion, even though it's technically called anti or, or non-religion, I guess. Then there are those who are, they would say that, that they're spiritual, you know. In fact, maybe they would say they're pagan. It's kind of growing in the United States. but I, So here's paganism is kind of weird because um, paganism in many, in many ways has died. Like, uh, you know, Greek, some of the Greek religious, Roman religion, some of the uh, Scandinavian, like Viking type thoughts on, on paganism and the, and the Norse gods and all this kind of stuff. For the most part, that died out and people stopped believing in that whenever they accepted Christianity and, and uh, whatever religions. But what happened is our society kind of brought them back because it sounded, it sounded neat, <laughs> okay? And so what you'll find with some of these even if it's atheism, you know, humanism, paganism, whatever, oftentimes these people were raised with a Christian worldview. But they've mixed that in with this new thing that they're wanting to believe. And so uh, you'll find that people can actually relate pretty well to the Christian view, even though they claim to be something else. So lots of things to think about when you're talking to people. Uh, Eastern religions. A lot of spiritism and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, just uh, ancestor worship and all this kind of stuff. Catholicism, you know, if you're following a, a Protestant line, or I hate to even say Protestant, but like a, 
I would just say uh, biblical Christianity. Like if you're following the Bible and you're and you're uh, looking at at uh, re- at your religious views based on the Bible only, not traditions of man and not all the uh, the fathers and the church history writers. Well, then you're going to have a certain worldview that is pretty much pretty different than Catholicism. Okay. So when we preach the gospel to someone, we need to understand there are all these different views that could possibly be coming out. So look at Acts chapter 17. You're probably already there. Acts chapter 17. And uh, always think about this. The way that Paul presents the gospel in this setting is so much different than how he presents it when he's just talking to uh, his Jewish friends and, and, uh, and, and brother, Jewish brothers. Okay, now let me see here. Uh, Let's start with verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogues of the Jews. These were more noble than those of Thessalonica in, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things be so. So you see that they... Uh, they found themselves going to the synagogues because that's where people were more likely to understand their worldview, know their mess- message, and be able to understand that. <coughs> now skip down to uh, verse 15. And they, I'm sorry, let's go to uh, verse 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. So now you got Paul all by himself uh, in Athens. And they that con- conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. Uh, and, I'm sorry, now we got him in Athens. <laughs> and received, receiving the commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed uh, they departed. Okay, now we got Paul here in Athens all by himself. Now when Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. You know, we tend to go out with soul winning partners, right? You want, you know, two are better than one, Ecclesiastes says. So when we go out and we're doing the work of evangelizing, whatever, it's good to have groups of people, have teams even, like two, you know, maybe there's four people, two, two groups of two uh, that are doing this street, and then another one. Is, it's good to have, have teams. And so I can see, I can kind of picture in my mind, like Paul is supposed to be waiting in Athens for them. That's what it says in verse uh, 17. I mean, verse 16. He's supposed to be waiting for his, his partners to come so that they can begin evangelizing and all that. And as he walks around, he just sees the city just totally given over to idolatry and, and uh, not understanding at all the things of God. And so he's just like moved inside him. He's just, he, he says that his spirit was stirred up in him. Okay, therefore disputed he in, where did he start? The synagogue with the Jews. So there were some Jews there. He started there trying to reach out to them. And with devout persons and in the market daily with, all, with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And, said, and uh, some said, what will this babbler say? Yes, he's a Baptist preacher. I mean, he called him a babbler. <laughs> I mean, read about uh, Eutychus falling asleep and falling out of the door as he preached till midnight. He's a Baptist preacher. Okay, other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine wherein thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We, know, uh, we would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers... Uh, which were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, now listen to how he preaches the gospel here, completely different than how he would, you know, a lot of times if they're preaching to the Jews, they go straight to the Old Testament, they begin to preach, you know, all the fathers and the prophets and the things that they said. Here, he doesn't start there. He's, He's got a different approach. 
says, I perceive that in all things, uh, and I, uh, that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. He took advantage of this, this weird thing they had, this, this idol. He said, well, just in case there's another God that we don't know yet, we're just, we'll just put here, to, and we'll just put, he's the unknown God, right? And so Paul uses this as an opportunity. He says, oh, I'm going to tell them who the unknown God is. It's the real God. None of these are actually gods. I'm going to show them who the real God is. And he says this, God that made the world. Now, this morning I talked about how God communicates. Remember, I talked about natural revelation and how people inside them should have this natural ability as they look around creation, as they think about what's inside of them and their conscious and everything. They should have this natural kind of interest in the things of God and who their creator is and all this. He says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needeth, any, needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the, all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they should feel after him, and uh, doesn't say happily, happily, like I just happened to, you know, that kind of idea. They might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some also of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. Now again, he started off by taking advantage of this idol to the unknown God and says, hey, I can... I can use that to kind of slowly bring them to the message that I want to, want to preach. Then he quoted some of their poets. Okay, so he knew. I don't know if he learned in that short time he was there or if he had already studied it out or whatever, but he's going to use some of their philosophies, some of their poets that they have said. And he does this in other places as well. Uh, Crete, to the Cretans, he, he does the same thing. And he, he brings up what some of their poets say. And so he kind of is familiar, familiar with uh, some of their beliefs. And here's, what, uh, and here's what it says in verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven uh, by art and man's device. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. So he's brought this now all the way to Jesus and says, like, this is the man that God brought into the world. And then he, he rose from the dead. Okay, the resurrection was the big thing that they were teaching uh, at that day to, to get people to understand. Now, a lot of them knew Ju Judaism. They knew the, belief, the religion of the Jews. Okay, but now this man's teaching that, okay, the Messiah came. And they killed him, and he rose from the dead, which is what happened. And so people are having a hard time with that. So Paul has now taken some time. Of course, we only see this in this one paragraph, but he is, who knows how long this actually took. He's taken some time to explain some things. And in verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed, among, uh, among the which was uh, Dionysius, the Arapagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with him. Okay, so <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me give you a few points on this, okay? Looking at how Paul approached these people with a completely different worldview, okay? Now, number one, <laughs> we should be moved to know that there are people out there that have no knowledge of God's word, no understanding of Christian principles and all that. Now, like much of the world has, has actually, you know, like I was saying earlier about the atheists and, and all, uh, sometimes, you know, an atheist will come and say something about like, well, I've got good morals and I don't even believe in God. So obviously you don't have to be a Christian to have good morals. And then if you, 
you know, question them a little bit farther, what you find out is they have a grandma or a mom who was a Christian and raised them with Christian principles. And then later on, they decided to become atheists, but they still run their life with a certain amount of principles that are, are Christ-like. So, therefore, they actually still have a bit of that worldview of Christianity, but they've just chose to go after, like, what they're calling a atheism. But we're talking about people who literally have no upbringing that way. They have no understanding. They're from a different culture. A lot of times we only see that from someone who's actually from a different country and they've come here as a refugee or something like that. And we see like they have very little understanding maybe of, uh, of our worldview. We see that Paul in verse 15 and 16 He's, he's, his spirit is stirred inside of him, and he, and he sees these guys uh, uh, totally given to idolatry, and, and he's stirred up, it says in verse 16. And, and, uh, and so he couldn't help it. He wanted to figure out a way to talk to them and, and convince them and show them who Jesus is so that they could repent and turn to him, that man by whom God's going to judge the world. Okay, so uh, it's easy to get to this point where we're so uncomfortable talking to someone who has a different worldview. You know, they, they grew up completely different than we do. They didn't grow up with the Bible. I've met 60-year-olds who have never been to church, never read the Bible, never really thought about that or, or anything. And I'm talking about right here in the United States, which is kind of uh, strange. But that's, there, there are people all around us, primarily, you know, those who came from different, different parts of the world or whatever, who have never uh, been taught those things. It should move us to compassion, like, hey, I, I need to take the opportunity to teach this person those things. But it's very easy for us to look at that and say, man, that's just too difficult. Like, we're in two different worlds. And so, you know what? Let him go his way and have his religion, and I'll go my way and have my religion. We'll just have two different worldviews that we'll just never see eye to eye. And there are some people that have that approach, even when giving the gospel. You know, if you don't believe the Bible, if you don't understand these things, like, there's no point in me even preaching the gospel to you. You're not going to get it. And that's unfortunate because there's a there's a, a whole audience of people out there who are going to die and go to hell if they don't hear about Jesus. We got to find a way to get them that uh, that understanding. Now, there's definitely a time to go to the synagogues. All right, if you look at verse 17, there it says they disputed. Uh, therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. Okay, so he starts there, chapter 16. We read that in verse 39. Uh, no, we didn't. We, uh, I don't know. Somewhere in this chapter I read that. But if you go back to chapter 16, verse 39, they came and besought them. Uh, no, where am I at? 16. I don't know. What am I doing? <clears throat> it's been a long day. <laughs> Here's the thing. You could follow the life of Paul, and you could see, like, over and over, this is his custom. He goes to the synagogues. He begins talking to the Jews, and he begins trying to preach to them, reasoning from their worldview because he's very familiar with it. So it becomes, it becomes very easy for us to think, and it's too difficult to talk to somebody who's a Muslim or somebody who's uh, got this uh, totally different worldview than I do. Uh, but there is, So there is a time to talk to somebody. I mentioned this morning about how even like somebody who's Catholic, completely different than us uh, in, in many ways as far as what they teach from, from, about Jesus, but you know, we do have some common grounds. We do understand the Trinity and who God is. We do understand that there was a Christ who was born of a virgin, who died on the cross, and then he rose from the grave. I mean, they believe in all these things. And so it's really easy to talk to a Catholic at the door. Probably one of our most receptive and most uh, uh, common salvations we get is somebody had a Catholic background and just didn't completely understand it, and we show them the Bible, and they say, wow, that makes sense. And so, uh, uh, you know, we try to find common grounds uh, with, with people but maybe whenever with somebody who's got a completely different worldview, you know, maybe our approach, the way we normally do our soul winning, you know, where we try to not, let me just get this presentation out in 10 minutes and then go to the next house and, and all that, probably this isn't going to be the best setting for something like that. Now, we can try. We certainly can spend some time uh, trying to, to get familiar with their, their belief system. I remember not too long ago I talked to this lady who was a, uh, a Muslim lady, and she came, and at first I was like, oh, she's not going to want to talk to me. She had all the, uh, the outfit on, and inside her house was, like, lined with sheets. A lot of times you'll know 
uh, in it's a lot of African cultures, well, they're just, instead of wallpaper, they'll just take these, these golden or elaborate sheets and they'll just kind of decorate the walls with them. It's kind of neat looking, actually. And they have a little carpet in there and everything. And uh, so this lady came and she shut the TV off and she came and she was talking with me. And, and, uh, and so I'm like, here's a lady that grew up Muslim. I know nothing about Islam, you know. Uh, I know about Jesus. And so I said, well, how can I talk to her about Jesus? Well, I know that Muslims believe there was a Jesus. They just believe something different about it. So I said, let's start there. And so I said, you know, I've heard that Muslims believe in Jesus. You know, can you tell me about what they believe about that? And we went back and forth and we had this conversation. And I realized after a little while, like she was saying more about believing in Jesus, you know, thinking about who Jesus was more than what the Muslims teach. And so finally I found out she had been watching you know, here they are in the United States, and they're not going to get in trouble for reading the Bible or listening to preaching. And so she's taking the time to listen to some Christian preachers on TV. And she, so she was getting familiar with some of these ideas and all this stuff. And so, like, I spent quite a while there, and I ended up having, like, there was a lot of distractions and people coming in and out or whatever. And uh, she had to kind of cut it short, dinner time or something like that. And I didn't know if she was just being nice to me or whatever, but here's what I found out about her. I found out what she grew up believing about Jesus. I found out that she was learning some things about Jesus by watching, you know, Christian TV or whatever. And so it was a, it was a, it was a instance where, man, I wish I had been more prepared. I wish I would have thought about how to bring her the gospel like more clearly. But I was just trying to take time to figure out, like, what are these common grounds and what can I do? So that next time, whenever I do witness to somebody with that worldview, I understand where they're coming from. You know, I get to the point where I say, hey, even one of your prophets, you know, if it doesn't, it didn't even Muhammad say. And I can quote to them something from the, uh, from the Quran, the Quran, and they would be like, you know, hey, this guy took time to study my belief. And I can kind of understand that, and then I can turn them to the Bible. But what I want to show you there is that this takes a lot of time. This takes a lot of effort. We must work to gain their attention, okay? It's going to take work. It's going to take effort. But we have to have this desire within us to see that they receive Jesus as well. And so we, we, we need to work to gain their attention. We see here in the text that... Uh, that he was going to all these different places, not just the synagogue. He was going to the marketplace. You know, he was going anywhere the people were, anywhere where he might get an audience. And we need to uh, uh, try to find opportunities to reach people. Uh, again, soul winning, the way that we do it might not always be the best to reach this group of people. Sometimes you can organize some kind of Bible study. You know, I, I wouldn't recommend that for everybody. But you could uh, try to find somebody, hey, would you, well, could we schedule a time where you could sit down and, and talk to the pastor? Or, or you, you know, we could, we could come up with some kind of an idea to, to have a Bible study where we could talk more about that. Perhaps we could find opportunities to get into the schools and set up some. There are actually opportunities to get into the schools where they're teaching the humanistic, humanistic philosophies. Sometimes we can actually get in there and teach, of course, on uh, our religious views. Uh, there, there are ways to, to, to do that. Uh, but, you know, some of these things are going to take time, and it's going to have a lot of sitting down, comparing ideas, you know. Second point is this. We need to provide some intelligent arguments, right? Again, you can't just go down your Bible necessarily and just preach the regular plan and just blah, 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 and these people have no idea. Look what Paul did. Paul went back, and he started reasoning with them and saying, you know, hey, God is, 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 is everywhere, right? In him all things consist. And, and, uh, and he begins to explain something using some of their ideas and what some of their poets had said. And he brings that into a reality. Hey, God is. But God, you know, brought this man, Christ Jesus, and he, and he, and he begins uh, walking them down that story. Notice that Paul disputed with them. Look at verse 17. Wherefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons, and in the marketplace with them that met with him. And then he ends up talking to these philosophers, Epicurean Stoics. And so, you know, all different types of people, but he was disputing with them. Now, when we talk about confrontational soul winning, we don't mean like go around arguing with people and yelling at them and fighting with them. We typically mean by, uh, by, by uh, you know, by actually confronting them in the sense that we're asking them, 
if they know for sure if they die they're going to heaven. I mean, that's confronting. That's saying, hey, the Bible says that you're a sinner, that we're all sinners. And if we got what we deserve, we die and go to hell. That's confrontation. You know, we're asking this person to do something about it, to make a, a change in their belief because where they're at right now uh, is going to lead them to hell. So we're, so we're confronting that. Okay, that's what we mean by confrontational soul winning. We don't mean that just go be jerks and just yell and holler and, and uh, you better turn or burn and, and hold up signs and all this kind of stuff. However, we do see that Paul was willing to dispute with somebody. Okay, and actually there comes a time in, a, in, in somebody who's trying to get the gospel out there where there's going to be arguments. Now, that's something we need to learn how to be loving, and we need to learn how to, to do it properly where we're not jerks, but we're having reasonable arguments with people. Uh, you know, we, we shouldn't be full of debates. That's something the Bible says that, that, that shouldn't be, like just constantly trying to debate and all this kind of stuff. This is a different subject, though. This is where you're trying to convince somebody of the gospel. And so in order to get that, or there's going to be some arguing, there's going to be some uh, disputing going on. And sometimes it's not going to end pretty is the reality of it. Uh, but we need to try to do that to the best of our ability in love and, and uh, speaking the truth in love. Okay, so we must uh, uh, provide some intelligent arguments. This requires a lot of patience and skill. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, look at verse 13. Uh, actually, start with verse 12, sorry. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Okay, so again, he's quoting a prophet of their own people. He says, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Okay, he's talking to Titus, and he's saying, when you go, you're going to encounter these things. And he's like, rebuke them sharply, right? They're, this group of people are evil beasts, okay, and they're slow bellies. So rebuke them sharply. I mean, this is going to take some, uh, uh, sometimes some disputing and sometimes being harsh with people in order to get them saved. But again, doing it with love, doing it with with intelligence and doing it with care and in the right and with the right motivation there are plenty of people who come from similar worldviews as ours but there are a lot but you know it, it, there are plenty of people that are come from a similar worldview than ours but are lost that we can preach the gospel to that's our most successful you know uh, in receptive audience but those are easy to win to the Lord but there are those who are going to take some work they're going to take, hey, let me study this and get back to you. Hey, let me sit down and have a Bible study with you. Let me, let me get your name. Hey, let me befriend you on, on uh, social media. Let me keep in contact with you. Let me, and, 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 and developing that. It takes time and it takes work. That's going to be a lot harder uh, to do. This might involve, uh, you know, again, setting appointments or, uh, or setting down and making, uh, taking a lot of study as to what they believe and forming uh, logical rebuttals against their their beliefs and their arguments. But there does come a point where a person is not going to see eye to eye and they reject our view and we have to move on. Okay, and we have to we have to go. At that point we just leave it in God's hands. Okay, so that brings us to our last point real quickly. We must allow God to do the final work among them. Okay, someone has got a completely different worldview than us. We've tried to reason with them. We've tried to bring them along. We've tried to Figure out where they're coming from, uh, you know, give rebuttals, uh, dispute with them a little bit, and ultimately we found out they're not interested. They're not going to listen. They don't care. So we just let God do the work. And here's what happened. Paul went. He did that. He disputed. Some people got mad. Some people mocked and all that. Look, look here, verse 32. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Okay? That's going to be a typical response that we get when we're out soul winning and someone's got a different worldview and we begin to preach Jesus and they're like that's such a silly fable that's such a silly you know belief that people teach that this man came and he was born of a virgin and he died and, he, and they're going to mock there's going to be mockers okay and we just bl brush that off and we just keep on going forward number two look at verse 32 he says and others said we will hear thee again of this matter like 
you know what you're saying is a little strange, it's a little hard for me to take in right now, why don't you come back another time and uh, give me some time to think about it. And we get that a lot when we're out soul winning. People have never heard that. We'll go through the entire gospel presentation and say, have you ever heard something like that before? They're like, no, I've never heard that. That's, that's really interesting. You know, to just jump on them and say, like, well, what are you going to do about it? You're going to receive the Lord Jesus Christ? A lot of times they'll be like, no, I've got to take this in. I've got to chew on this for a little while. Okay, you know, let's, let me come back here and check on you another day. Let's have another little study. Let me tell you more. A answer some of your questions, all that kind of stuff. It takes time and work, you know, to talk to somebody with a different worldview. All right, so some mock. Some say, you know, we'll hear, again, we'll hear you again another time. And then look at verse 34. Thankfully, how be it certain men clave unto him and believed. Okay, and so there's always going to be that payoff in the end where somebody of a completely different worldview comes around and now they are, uh, they are, are like-minded. You know, there are people in this congregation right now and this morning, you know, the people that were in here who have a background that was a lot different than what we teach and a lot different than what the Bible teaches. You know, there, we have, uh, you know, some that came from an atheist background or whatever. Uh, there were some ladies who were feminists before they got saved, and now they've had a radical change in their thinking because of the Bible, but it's taken time, it's taken work, it's taken uh, effort for them to see what the Bible says and to begin to grow in those kinds of of things. So preaching to somebody with a different worldview. Number one, we got to work to gain their attention. Okay, it's, a, it's an effort to figure out how can I get their attention? How can I get them to listen to me where I can present my, uh, my worldview based on the Bible? Number two, we must provide some intelligent arguments. Boy, that takes work. It's hard for me to provide an intelligent conversation of any kind. <laughs> you know, to actually make a rebuttal against their worldview takes some work and some study and some effort. And then finally, we must allow God to do the final work among them. Some will mock, some will want to hear you again, and thankfully some will believe. But we've got to go do the work and present the gospel even to those with a different worldview. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us opportunities to go and preach your word and, and to try to get people saved. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to make an effort to learn how to present the gospel to people with a completely different worldview than us and, and help us take the time that's needed to be able to prepare for that, uh, help equip us with knowledge from the Bible as we learn and grow and study uh, so that we can use these things and help us understand the different views that are out there and, and get uh, an education uh, about the different worldviews, <laughs> not in any way that would trip us up or, call, or lead us astray, but ones that would just strengthen our position and help us to be able to understand how to present the gospel to these people. Lord, we pray that whatever the case, you'll just bless the efforts, Lord, as we try to reach people for, for Christ and that you'd be honored and glorified by the fruit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.